Okay, I would suggest you go to Coursera, sign up for this course. It's at the University of Geneva, and it's Particle Physics and Introduction. And that's where you got to start. you got to start the introduction, because the things that they're talking about, that's pretty deep. They're going into leptons and quarks and all these uh, spins and ups and downs and things and fermions, which I am going to tell you right now, I do not agree with this. All right, so let's start from that, because this is where I'm coming at. But I have evidence to present, and they have theories. Let's start with my evidence. Okay, this is the evidence. This is the leading edge of a pulsed red laser. The actual laser light is right there. That's it, right there. Everything else is compression shockwave. This is that same laser pulse. And this is, again, the ray in the center. The rest is shock wave. It is being stretched and elongated, and I claim that is being accelerated. Now let's go in a little closer and see what we have here. All right. Now, coming out of the, the um, pulsed red laser beam is the particle beam. That's what's creating all this shock. Now, you see, whoops, I hope you can see the little white ray here that is now becoming, compressing other particles. This is a stream of particles. Those particles are now are invading each other's region. Each particle has to have a region around it that it owns and as they come through in a beam they create this shock wave coming through the air but now they're becoming compressed into each other and starting to crush each other as they approach the venturi which is two airplane wings with a thin slot as it approaches there it has no option other to increase power and speed there is no option at this point, the magnetic fields that surround these particles become so totally compressed that they irradiate backwards in a reverse magnetic field to an enormous extent. And if you look down here closely, you can see these little white tiny dots. Those little white tiny dots all over in there. Let me bring this up a little bit. Those tiny white dots are the free electrons that are in the air that are called ether. Used to be called ether. That is the only reason these shock waves cre are created because they're trying to push these ether particles, which are also ne negative. These are negative. Whoops, can't see that. Can you? Right. These ether particles are negative particles. When n other negative particles crash through them, they create a shock wave. And you can actually see the difference between the wave and the push and then the compression out here. This is the reverse magnetic radiation from this enormous event. This is plasma now. These particles no longer have the ability to, to control their regions. They are touching each other virtually at this point. And Rod Warren, who took these pictures, said he could actually hear them sizzle on occasion. Not all the time, but, you know, and he did a lot of stuff with this. He did a lot of work on this. So, and this is not something you're going to put together in a couple of minutes either. That's why nobody's recreating this. Well, I have a couple other guys working on it right now, but uh, Rod has backed off of it, and um, and we need somebody else to step in and t to continue his work so that we can see this in its trueness. Now, coming out from the accelerator over here, you end up with this white Cheryenkov radiation. Right. Now, as it comes down and they push away from each other, the center ones get more, more push.
pushed in from both sides and then these get pushed out and then they start to form these lines and then the final ones just splay all over the place and now we're going to look at it coming from this way but take away from this is the wave is being stretched I say that's acceleration I say that is light acceleration that I say is Cheryenkov radiation I say this is particles invading each other's regions stacking up trying to crush through I say these little dots all over the place here are are um, the ether particles that are in the air and they are being excited and that's what you see as glowing light when you see light I'm saying this is accelerated. This is a venturi. I have to say that this is the quantum distance. As they come down, they start to settle. And at this point, they start to create what we are going to call Higgs bosons. These are, the, these are the boson particle carriers. They're charged particles. They carry fields with them. Any charged particle moving through anywhere creates a magnetic field around it and it's called the right hand rule they spin this way if it's going that way they spin this way if it's going that way and I have evidence to sh support that as well this shows that this, the light is spinning in this direction because it's going that way it's accelerated here you can see the spacing is wider up here they compress a little further out they will start to form the Higgs fields this is looking into the accelerator. That's the Cheryenkov. That little white particle filaments are the he, uh, the uh, bosons, which is the charged particle. At this point, it's still in extreme excitation. All of a sudden, it hits the air, which is not compressed any longer, and they start to blow up into these fields, which is the charged particle is catching a field surrounding that charged particle. This field is being crushed by these two fields surrounding it, invading its region, forcing it into this shape, and giving it a higher frequency potential. It's a, it's a purplish glow. The other ones are down in the lower frequency range. And it, 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 everything that I'm showing you is exactly what they claim is is high energy Cheryenkov radiation which smashes into a different media medium which is now not compressed any longer into the na natural atmosphere is exactly what they say and then the boson is the particle that is spinning through space and crashes into something and that creates a field surrounding it and they call those uh, neutrino electron neutrino fields showers and that's what you see electron neutrino showers and what is this field what does that consist of that consists of a particle in the dead center and all this array of Fibonacci looking patterns is polarized ether all right, those are the particles that are sitting around in the air, primarily water molecules, I would assume. And they turn into little, you know, max little bar magnets and create this, this pattern surrounding the charged particle which is in the center. This very excited white particle over here all right, is right up here. That particle is, I believe, spinning backwards. It exhibits no magnetic field around it, and that is exactly what happens in the case when a particle spins backwards, and it is the case where, where Venus is spinning backwards. Extreme heat from Venus, extreme glow here, which means heat, no magnetic field from Venus, no magnetic field here. It's a spinning particle backwards. Sp part Venus spins backwards. It's single spin one day to us is 24 hours there. It's over 200 days. It is scrubbing into the ether, which is the ether is everywhere because it is light particles. All right. And here's another one for you. These light particles, when they leave the sun, are still these same particles. They are still these same little particles that I showed being accelerated. They are in space dark because they are not compacting with anybody else they're just floating through space getting ready to come down and interact with matter gravitationally which is magnetism 
that glowing non-field particle is right there. It's coming through here with no field. Somehow, it interacts with this field. Remember, the particle is only dead centered and almost nothing here. But the field that surrounds it is enormous. It really is enormous. That's why when they did the experiments, I'm going to show you some experiments they did in the 1800s. They, they came up with, um, I believe the field size was a thousand times bigger than they thought it would be, so they just dropped the whole thing. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But this is an impact. That's what I'm seeing. And I'm seeing this. Now, is that going to become this size? I do not know. This apparently is turning into a field similar to this. This needs to be investigated. It's the only occurrence I've ever seen of that. This needs to be looked into. This is the accelerator. Remember they come out in all that white cherry ink claw? Then they start to step down. Then I, I see this. I've seen this a couple of times. These particles are, are whatever they are. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what they are. There's two dark spots and two white spots. Now, I, I'm, I'm working on this, trying to figure out what exactly are we seeing, because we're seeing spikes up the top and the bottom. I've got one in green a little better to show you, but they, it, it only, they only happen for two, two frequencies, waves, and then it turns into a different particle. See, it's white, black, white, and then it does this, and then it's black, white, black. I don't know, it's an inverted Oreo pattern, something like that. All right, there they are in the trail. Now we're going to see them right up close. Okay, that is what we see. Now I know it was light going through, coming out of the lasers. No question was light. No question whatsoever it went through that, that Venturi slit and appeared to excite whatever happened there. No question whatsoever when it came out the other side. It had different components as it stepped down in its intensities. No question whatsoever we see this in at least a couple of different occasions out of thousands and thousands of pictures, yes. But I've seen this, I believe, twice. The red one and the green one. And this uh, is what we see. Now, what are we looking at? What, as this thing started to decay in its power. So I'm saying it came through the accelerator. Bam, 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 it's flying everywhere. And then they start to settle down and it does this. Why they are so exactly this direction and the next one exactly the same, why they're not all flying around, I cannot say. Although the Earth has a polarity that would interact with the polarity of this. The only thing I can take away from it. Now, what are we looking at? I'm looking at two, two things going on here. There's a circle, like maybe a donut, a round circle of power. Now, is it circling a bar of no power? Like, uh, you know, and I'm going to do this on the chalkboard, but I'm, I was thinking this was like a, a hot dog in here surrounded by a donut of power. Something's going on here. So, and, 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 that, and this is an, uh, an electron. Now, I always thought the electron only had one charge if it was negative. And, 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 and I, don't, I, can't, I can't justify that by what I see. I really can't. I don't know what to think. I really don't. <laughs> However, I somehow in my mind, I'm trying to convert this into a torus. And, 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 and the neck would be the choke. It's called inductance. So, and the, the capacity of the big f bulbous part of the toroid is capacitance. So you have inductance at the neck. You have capacitance in the cavities. And somehow it's going in there, creating a, big, a huge magnetic reverse field, bouncing it back, something like that. Because that's what happens in a solenoid. You charge up a solenoid, and then when you, when you cut the power, it discharges back 10 times the applied voltage. You put in 12 volts, it comes back 120 volts. And I did that to my wife one day. <laughs> I said, hold this solenoid. I'm just going to put 12 volts. It won't hurt you. And I put it through the solenoid operator, pulled the plunger, and I said, oh, that's good. And I let go of the power. And she jumped up in the air, and she said, well, you shocked me. I said, no, it couldn't shock. It's only 12 volts. Then I realized what happened. It's inductance of the, of the, the solenoid built this huge field around it. And when I cut the power, poof, it pops back. It's a reverse EMF. And, and you have to have all kinds of um, 
diodes in the circuits. I did, the, did this for a living, and I understand this stuff. You have to have diodes in there. They will only let the power go in one direction. When you collapse a field, you, you can't let it go back the other direction. All right, so anyway, because it spikes back into the, cause all kind of problems. Anyway, um, that, that uh, eesh, I don't know. And I don't know what is in the core either. And the core, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't believe there's any neutrons whatsoever. I think that core of every atom is, uh, the positives are completely en engulfed by electrons. And so you, until they exceed just a little bit, which they always do, because they say, oh, the neutron's just a little bigger than the proton, so there's always a little extra neutron in there. No, there's a little extra negative in there, keeping the negatives that still want to get in there at a distance. And I will show you that in a, in a simple toy. All right, he's got a magnet there, a strong positive surrounded by strong negatives. Boom. This wants to get to the positive. The negatives say, we got enough negatives, you're going to have to stay at a distance. They will start to line up in orbitals, all keeping a separate distance from each other according to their um, magnetic regions. Now, now this is heat. More electrons are being forced into this system. Either light or heat. There it goes. Now, it, it, as soon as they fly away, it is actually light. At this point, it's extreme heat. There goes light. All right, so that is the nature of quantum, and that is the nature of vibrational energy. That is the nature of heat, and when they start to really bounce like that, they'll, they'll begin to luminesce, and then they will begin to really excitedly shoot out electrons. And that magnetic toy does exactly the same thing this happens on our sun. Shake, 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 shake. Electrons take off. Spin, 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 spin. Some spin faster. They impact with nothing out here because there is nothing for them to crash into. No nucleuses. Until they hit the atmosphere or our planet or the space station or a comet or a meteor. In the interim, they are dark matter and dark energy. They still have their potential, uh, their, their mass, and they still have the energy capability, and it is only exhibited on impact. All right? That's how I am taking the, the whole matter of, of matter. And I believe that the nucleus has no electrons whatsoever. These gluons and all these things are, are not realistic. Now, I can see that the light particles themselves, and I see the particles actually, then I can see that the light particles can actually be broken down into smaller particles. So, this is my area that I, I, I have no big explanations for. And I can see a particle that looks like a particle, it looks like energy, it looks like on and off energy, it looks like possibly a torus, it could be capacitive and inductive reactants choking in the in the neck and capacitance in the the body. I don't know, but you know they, these are the things I'd like to at least. These are things that I have researched and I think are are uh, you know material evidence, not just guesses. These are material evidence should be looked at. And other people are doing some work on this right now. I'm, try I'm trying to get a community going on this because it was just Rod Warren and I. And Rod was just doing the pictures. I did all the atomic work. And Rod has no interest in that. He's got an interest in something else that really should be looked at as well. And that is he thinks he may actually be seeing something in the light that could be dimensional. That I can't help him with and he has no interest in the atomic part. So he sort of walked away from this a while back. So now I'm trying to get some other people into this. And I hope Rodney will come back in. Rod, I'd love to have you come back in, brother. Because you were the best, my friend. And I know how much work you put into this. And I don't think anybody else is going to be able to weather that storm. All right. So anyway, um, I think this needs to be taken a look at. If this is right, then they're just walking around coming up with fantasies with all these gluons and quarks and leptons and this and that. I mean, I'm seeing the colors they're talking about leptons. That might be. There might be three three leptons. They talk about lilac colors and this and that. And I can see the particles break. I can see them split into that little tiny light trumpet, whatever that was. 
and that was a reverse spinning particle, I believe, impacting with a normal particle. Is that antimatter hitting matter? I don't know. Whatever it is, it is. But I have things that are very simple to do. Anybody can do them almost at, at home. Very inexpensive. And I think it sheds a lot of light on light and dark matter. So, Mud Fossil University on YouTube. A lot of stuff we consider there and virtually everything we consider there. All right. So, I'd like to have some comments. I'd like to have some responses. Some physicists. Somebody that feels they have a, a, a grasp on these sort of matters. And then, you know, I'd like to have some, engage in some conversation and see if somebody else can recreate this work. Because right? we've really reached, I'm, I'm, I've reached the end of my road on it, basically. I'm working with some sound engineers because sound is nothing more than electricity, but it's on a vibrational level until it reaches conduction. And, and, and he's able to make all of these different patterns of electricity that I'm observing. And the, the, pa the uh, rule of eight is showing up all over the place, which is the, uh, it's an, an atomic rule. Anyway, please, somebody um, take some interest and um, comment on this. I'm readily available. All right, thank you. And last but not least, this is the what light is. It comes out, it spins forward like this and then they create these huge fields around it. What we're seeing is the actual particle impacts coming through the venturi this way and they spin that way. If they come through this way, they spin the other way. What they have, and then they make these, these interference patterns in the back because the electrons are all negative. The ones coming through try to force these in this direction, and they try to force the other ones in that direction. Those try to force the other ones, the other ones, the other ones. And then by the time you get to the end, there's nobody left to force. <laughs> they're all done. Now, this is what happens why they think they're a wave. If you look at it from this direction, you know, that's a wave. And that's a wave. That's a frequency. That's a low frequency. That's high frequency. So the more spins, here, you see, they, they claim that they, go, they all go the same distance at the same time. So, if this one has come way out here and it has only that much spin, that means the angular momentum is slow. It's kind of lazy going out there, bang. This one here is like this and still going this far, all spun up like a rocket ship. It, at the same distance, when that hits something, it's going to hurt. So, that's the difference with mass. And anyway, it's it's a circular pattern. It's not there's not they have talked about waves and this and that. There, there is no waves and there there's no photons. All that was not correct, is my opinion. And and it's a, a spinning particle. And that particle is what we consider an electron. Now let's look at what we think is the electron. Okay, this is, uh, it's kind of hard to believe that they just forgot all this stuff because all of this has already been figured out long ago. This is about the discovery of free electrons outside of matter. So inside of matter, we know there's electrons. No question whatsoever. Outside of matter, is there electrons? Yes, there is. There's static electricity. They're in the vacuum of space. And they create them in these vacuum fields. Now listen to this. This guy, um, well, you go in and study it if you want. But just the takeaway of this is it's crooks and these guys that did a bunch of work on this. Furthermore, by applying a magnetic field, he was able to deflect the rays. So they're shooting these rays, thereby demonstrating that the beam behaved as though it were negatively charged, because it is. They can deflect it by because it's negative. They put a negative against it, push, pushes it away. In 1879, he proposed that these properties could be explained by what he termed radiant matter. Well, it's not radiant, it's the electrons. It's ether. He suggested that this was a fourth state of matter consisting of negatively charged molecules. Well, they're not molecules, they're just they're, they're portions of molecules that were being projected with high velocity from the cathode. I mean, it's just, they knew this long ago. Now listen to this now. Hold on one second. All right, now this is electrons inside of a vacuum. All right, they're glowing in here, and they put a magnet up against it, and it, it 
they've got a magnet over here and it's causing this to, to respond to that field's pushing against it. So the electrons are, are getting away from the electrons that the field is presenting against it. All right, Sir William Crookes was the first guy to really have a high vacuum tube. He made a tube that had a high vacuum. And he could actually look inside, and he, then he showed that the luminescence, which is the light, the rays, appearing within the tube carried energy now, and, and you could see them glowing and they moved from the cathode to the anode right? so they moved from negative over to the positives so obviously from the negatives going towards the positive they're negative energy and you could see them actually flow and this right over here is that device is well it's not the device he made which is a radiometer but this is showing that these are the particles within they're just floating around inside this vacuum chamber all right because there's nothing for them to interact with they're just floating around in here now all of a sudden they put a magnet over here the magnet says okay i'm coming in a field in here get out of my way they say okay no problem they get out of the way and this presents a field in the center which has no no electrons to it because it's pushing the electrons out of the center. All right, if you saw the light um, acceleration, it's it's absolutely phenomenal how much increase that that field presented in a reverse magnetic field. Now listen to this. This is a smoking gun right here. All right, the German-born physicist. Arthur Schuster expanded upon Crookes' experiments by placing metal plates parallel to the cathode rays and applying an electric potential between the plates. All right, so he's he's put, putting metal plates and the cathode rays going between them, which is the electrons, and then he's putting a, a metal a potential on the plates. So what happens to the ray inside? The field deflected the rays toward the positively charged plate. Okay, so you got a negative and you got a positive. And then going through here, so it pushes the negative towards the positive. Providing further evidence that the rays carried negative charge. Obvious seems to me obvious. It's pushing the negative towards the positive. Seems normal. Now listen to this. However, this produced a value that was more than a thousand times greater than what was expected. So little credence was given to his calculation at the time. The field surrounding these particles is enormous. John Glenn went into space and he could see these highlighted in the, the rising sun. He said they were seven to eight feet apart. The fields surrounding are just incredibly large. They didn't realize a thousand times more power than they had expected, so they just dropped it. So now we go a little further. In 1892, Lorentz suggested the mass of these little particles, which were the electrons, could be a consequence of their electric charge. Right? I agree with that. There is some kind of a charge going on there. I don't know how it originally originates, but there's an electric charge in these electrons. Now, in 1890, and listen to this now, 1896, a British physicist Thomson and his colleague Townsend and Wilson performed experiments indicating cathode rays really were unique particles, not waves, they're particles, rather than waves. Atoms or molecules, as was believed earlier, they're particles. They weren't atoms, they weren't molecules, and they weren't waves. Thompson made good estimates of both the charge and the mass, which is M, finding the cathode ray particles, which he called corpuscles, had perhaps one thousandth the mass of the least massive ion known as hydrogen, which is the proton, they call it, which is, it, I believe now they're saying it's 1834, 1836 times. You know, you need 1836 electrons to make one proton mass. However, they also say that the mass, I mean the um, charge of an electron is the same as the charge of a proton. There's some go something going on wrong here, but maybe it's possible. Maybe there's, I just don't know about that part at all. The nucleus I'm, I'm really unsure of right now. I had suspected 
that it was nothing more than electrons attached to protons and, and the protons for some reason come in masses of like a gross weight at a time <laughs> and the electrons come in single units or you know that type of thing I, I can't explain this but the protons appear to increase in values of like huge quantities one one two three four right up the line hydrogen helium lithium so forth and 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 you know um i don't know why they go in those chunks which are the protons that i can't explain however if you took that and you said each proton is like a marble and the electrons are like little um grains of sand and you took them all and compacted them together you would have what I would consider to be a nucleus and then if you would have an, a couple of extra grains of sand that you shouldn't have in a nucleus which creates a, a negativity in that nucleus and then any more grains of sand coming in are held at bay and I'll show you that okay once again absolutely no disrespect meant to anyone everybody's trying to figure out these questions and fortunately Rodney um, came up with a way to physically see these things and now we're talking about electron neutrino well, leptons they call them and um, they're the lightest neutrino and then you got the muon neutrinos they're middle and the um, tau neutrinos the heaviest now that I have seen different size particles in the light so uh, I don't know and and we also saw a spinning backwards particle which would be extremely heavy very rare I would think but extremely heavy anyway I have my evidence put forward I understand their you know their theories and why they say these things and I've looked at how they came up with these conclusions and and um, and they just don't make sense to me at all the things that are leaving the sun are leaving as particles. They're arriving here as particles. In the interim, they're particles. They're just not seen. They're dark energy, dark matter. I think I have shown and displayed and demonstrated with evidentiary support exactly what these particles are. So I'm asking for someone to please respond. All right, Mud Fossil University, thank you.